This is the final of the three Teresa Duncan games, and it's a little bit different from the other two. Um, while those were more of kind of, I guess, contemporary vignettes so far as like contemporary in the mid 90s goes, um, this one is a historical piece which is set in um, 1899 uh, going into the 20th century. So, um, it is kind of tonally and in terms of the art style a little bit different, but uh, hopefully it's just as interesting and enjoying as the other two have been. So um, I have the emulation system here and I'm just going to click on the icon and open it up and we'll see. Oops. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Not sure if I just wait here or click on something. Just wait for a bit, enjoying the music and atmosphere. Oh, here we go. Pink A was born in a city you've probably heard of long ago, before you were born. It was a time before popsicles and paperbacks, a time before you had ever worn a bathing suit and dipped your one tiny toe into the vast blue ocean, squirming with starfish and sea anemones. Pink A was born far away in Paris, <laughs> at a time when a fire burned in every grate, and smoke curled black and feathery like a horse's tail from a thousand chimney pots. I would say these <laughs> chimneys look like left bank bohemians, each with a galois in the corner of his mouth, smoking, smoking. Only this, like winter fires, is a practice which has fallen by the wayside. But Pinke, who you will soon grow to know, was born into a world where fire gave off all the light and heat a child could expect to enjoy through a cold and snowy Parisian night. So, when she made her first entrance into this world, in one of the last years that began with the number 18, it was to the fire her nurse took her, and by the fire she chose to stay. Sparks blew across the fire grate that November night. The wind blew and the shutters slapped, and Pinke's seven sisters formed a constellation, each holding a candle flame outside the door where Pinke was soon to make her first entrance. They waited, each cupping her flame against any drafts, to hear from their nurse, Lucina, whether Pinke would be a girl, or as they rather hoped, a boy. <laughs> and so Pinke arrived, red and fat as a summer raspberry, and squalling like the snowstorm that flew and blew outside the windows. The seven sisters blew out the candles, tiptoed in, and peeped at the new baby. A girl, they sighed in unison, spying the pink ribbons in her hair. A pink A, cried the littlest, and gave her a tiny kiss. But pink A gave her own black pigtails a yank, pulled the pink ribbons from her hair, and made <laughs> such a racket that the nurse Lucina could quiet her only by rocking her in the old rocking chair by the fireplace. Pinke loved the fireplace and the hearth. While the seven older sisters slept, Pinke would lie awake in her rabbit pajamas, cradled in the arms of Lucina before the fireplace, listening to stories about the future. Lucina's stories and the tinderbox with its softly flaring, softly fading coals were what she loved most.
as she grew, she begged to help sweep the chimney or haul ashes down to the little poubelle. She could never pass by the shop that sold bread without pausing to stare into the window at the amber glow of the oven. On walks through the bois, she would trail behind Lucina and her sisters, collecting small branches to feed the evening fire. When she was old enough, she became a seller of tinder sticks and kindling and traveled from house to house via tree branches and drain pipes, listening everywhere to stories and gossip and helping to warm the Parisian populace. But December 31st, 1899 was a special night for Pinquet and for all of Paris. For that night was New Year's Eve, 1899, the hinge on which the century turns. At Harvey. midnight, the future would arrive. And what would the new year, 1900, with its round zero-zero, like eyeglasses peering into tomorrow, bring? Well, little Pinke discovered the future that night. Ah, the future. Let's go there. All right, I guess we're gonna <laughs> get there. All right, looks like we have left and right, and then the various things that you can visit on this street. Hmm. I think I want to go to the greenhouse first. And we go flipping off in that direction. <laughs> oh, this is very nice. Geneviève, <laughs> the future will be here in just a few hours. What will the future be like? Oh, I think the future will be gorgeous, Pinke. <laughs> they might enclose all of Paris under a grand glass dome. The trees along the boulevard will always be green, and the flowers will show their faces year round. Hmm. I guess I'll have to expand my business to keep the entire town warm in winter under the glass. Yes, of course, Pinke, but you are not alone. You have your seven sisters to help you. But would you like to join my party with the flowers, Pinke? I have many more stops, Genevieve. But Lucina will be coming by tomorrow to wish you a happy new year. And I'll be back tomorrow with wood and coals. Hmm. Oh dear. <laughs> Cactus is a bit scary. Got some weird mushrooms. Aloha. <laughs> nice pineapple. Oh, it's I in my pot of gold it is, are ya? <laughs> A bientôt. <laughs> Salut. I wonder what these. I know that one's exit, but I'll see what do these. Story on. The stars that night shone like the 100 bubbles swirling in a glass of fizzy lemonade, and the curls and flourishes of the architecture stood frozen like an interrupted song. 
Pink A wiped a clear spot into the frost with her sleeve and peeped into the glowing greenhouse window and saw blossoms as big as bonnets, flowers as bright as flamingos. And amid it all was Genevieve grand tending her gorgeous garden. Genevieve came from a large family like Pinquet, but the brothers and sisters had wandered to the four corners of the globe, some to China, some to Ceylon, and some to Chicago, so that now Genevieve was left alone with her carnations and her color lilies. She talked to the flowers and fruit and tended them with such care that they might have been her children. Mes enfants, mes chéris, she cooed to pineapples and posies and put a record on that fabulous new invention, the gramophone, for the flowers to dance to. All right, so I guess that's just um, a bit of kind of extra narration for each scene. And I guess now I want to try to turn on the gramophone over here. <laughs> going. Hmm. Can't get away from the mushroom dance, honestly. Okay, we got it. <laughs> figured our way out of that one. <laughs> that was a little strange. I guess this is just going back to the previous scene. Um, would be the lower button. All right, yeah, check it out. I think you are stinky. No, you are stinky. But <laughs> you are both stinky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not a plant. I'm from another planet. And this is not a ball. This is my spaceship. Very nice. All right. Let's see about the other places we can visit on this street. Got the greenhouse, catacombs, Looks spooky library, Le Drinke, and a toy store. Hmm. <laughs> the drama displayed behind the glass of the toy shop window was the rival of any stage production currently playing in Paris. That evening, a Joan of Arc doll clothed in shiny armor attacked the curls of a cardboard ocean wave. A pouty princess, infuriated by the predictability of her role, was being rescued from a castle tower by tin soldiers, and a snarling wolf was still on the prowl for a little red riding hood doll that had been sold two weeks ago. 
The assembly of toys was like the waiting room of a train station where the passengers were momentarily together, but would soon depart for separate journeys. The toys formed friendships, but they knew any minute the arms of some little boy or girl would sweep them into a better, more permanent universe. Pinke asked the toys if they had any ideas about the future, but they just showed her their pretty painted faces and stared silently toward the mm. street. All right. You could stand all night as a good child <laughs> and tell the wolves, get out of the trees, but they would not hear, and they can't, my dear, for there are no wolves such as these. <laughs> Interesting, I guess that's the Oops. Didn't quite mean to go back there yet. Keep hanging out in the toy store. Oh. The drama story of I'm finished. Uh oh, we got a wind up toad. Unfortunately, it turns into a person. Shock in the box. <laughs> These are some I weird toys. <laughs> I beg of you. Take the next coach back to town. Get me all of you. <laughs> Go now. That's no place for a child. Go home. I don't know. I kind of like it. <laughs> I really like how, um, ooh, just. In general, they've definitely expanded the, like, um, voice acting beyond just a narrator. Now it's pretty much everything has some sort of voice acting. Alright. That's a... Symbols monkey. Whoa. <laughs> That's like pretty racy for a children's game. <laughs> Vive la France. <laughs> there is Joan of Arc. Got the witch over here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Can we go into here? Ooh. <laughs> Goldilocks, Hamlet, the Bride of Frankenstein, and the Three Bears. Hamlet, why are you out here in the fog and the cold at this time of night? Oh, yes, my dear, I'm sorry I'm at it again. <laughs> Contemplating this wretched skull and its various implications. Oh, Sam, <laughs> you're always out here, at some odd hour, staring into the vacant eyes of that silly old skull. This cannot be such a good thing for you, I think. <laughs> oh, I know, darling, it's just that castle life is such a dreadful bore. Hmm, well, you're right about that. Act two. Well, if they think it's such a bore living in that castle, they should try a week or two in these tree infested suburbs. <laughs> ah, and let His Royal Highness Hamlet try eating the same old porridge day in and day out. Yeah, and let him try to sit here in my little chair, which has been broken to bits. Oh, come now. Life isn't really all that bad, is it? Come on, gang. The sun will still rise again tomorrow. The birds will still sing in the trees. Yeah. Well, maybe you're right, little girl. Ah, 
What do I know? I'm just a grouchy old bear. <laughs> yeah, and what do I know? I'm just a crazy old mama bear. Yeah, and what do I know? I'm just a silly little baby bear. <laughs> that was quite touching. All right, uh, so head out of the toy shop, and I guess we've gone down this street a little bit. We have. Oh, my French pronunciation is so horrible. I'm just gonna call him Pear. Pear Studio, Cinema, Bakery. I'm gonna go to the bakery. Bread sign looks really cool. <laughs> Bonjour. Story on. If for some reason you had fallen asleep and been transported by fairies or bandits or a strong gust of wind to the inside of the bakery on La Rue de la Croissant, you probably <laughs> would have awakened, rubbing your eyes and imagined you were in a fairyland. There were clouds of meringue, cookies shaped like <laughs> pots or swans or diamond rings and cakes molded into the heads of the great French philosophers. Philippe the baker and his assistant, Antoinette, were usually dusted from head to foot in flour. By the end of a night's work, they were covered like evergreens after a heavy snow. Pinquet stocked the kindling box with wood as Philippe pulled a rack of little Madeleine cakes from the bakery oven. He inhaled the sweetly scented steam of his creations. <laughs> I bake, therefore I am, he said, and placed the golden cookies in the shop window. Nice. Okay, we got some. Frosted cakes among frosted cakes. Where will we be then? <laughs> so, the name on a birthday cake might be misspelled. Does that make it taste bad? <laughs> That's actually pretty funny because we ordered a cake from my mom one year and it was, they spelled her name wrong. They spelled it, um, oh god, I think it was like, uh, instead of Barbara, it was just like, they forgot the second B, so it was just like, Barra, and they were like, okay, well, we still ate it, and then we went back to the same place and got a cake for her birthday the next year <laughs> and they spelled birthday wrong <laughs> so it was happy birthday um so I relate I understand where he's coming from Let's see if more philosophical wisdom from the cake <laughs> am I responsible for the bizarre convictions of some of my supporters those who would have their cake and eat it too. <laughs> Alright, so that was the philosophical cake. Oops. I hear that you're interested in the 20th century, Pinky. Yes. I want to know all about the future. Edgar over at Le Drinke says I'll be flying all around Paris. And Walter says we'll be strolling along the rings of Saturn. Have you been to Sybil de Soothsayer? She's been in a little tent over by the market stalls for years. Reading the future from a big deck of cards. A little monkey collects the money in an <laughs> old china teacup. It's just adorable. Anyway, she told my sister she'd be moving up in life, and the very next day, 
She got a job as a trapeze artist at the Colonial. I love the future. It's very modern, very chic. Fortune tellers, don't be so irrational. <laughs> to know what to expect from the future, you must read the great philosophers. Here. Aha. <laughs> So we have all these philosophical cakes, or baguettes as well. <laughs> Frosting. That the atelier of Poir was up, up, up the stairs, filled with light and close to heaven, for his dress designs were truly divine. Nicknamed Poir since childhood for his resemblance to a pear, he had been left alone amid the scissors and scraps of his grandmother's sewing basket, where he learned to sew so splendidly that now he designed for countesses, couturiers, and queens. Bonbon's bloomers were even made by Poir. All right, so um, oh, let's see the patterns. <laughs> patterns, the magazine of French decor. As a real reader they already knew, each month's patterns ask a French celebrity to design a theme room. To mark the close of the century, we turn to Poir, asking the famous designer. What pretel will the 20th century look like? What will to not look like was his first rather <laughs> hysterical response. When he had gathered his senses, however, where was a bit more articulate? All right. Since all the great styles <laughs> have already been invented during this century and by Parisians, the only thing for 20th century designers to do will be to mix them all up. You'll see, the <laughs> Fond Nouveau, a term Poir coined on the spot during an interview, and French neoclassicism, and machine made utilitarian furniture, all in the same room. There will be lots of straps, lots of blown glass. It will be fabulous. <laughs> It's certainly one perspective. Ah, the future according to Poir. Ah, so this is what his room would look like. Alright. Ding, ping! <laughs> That's a big no no. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Got some famous clientele with Countess Chachki <laughs> and oh, back to see the flowers. <laughs> All right, so this is um kind of a bit uh racy for a kids game, but we have to match all the different pairs of themed underwear now. <laughs> so I'm not very good at matching games. They so forgive me if this takes forever. I got the hearts. No. No. Blue dots. No. Orange flowers. Zebra stripe. <laughs> oh, no. Sea maze. What's that? We. Oui. We. Oui. I got that one. <laughs> All right. Cheetahs for when you gotta go fast. No. Halloween. <laughs> oh. No. 
I've seen this before. See, yep. We oui. got that one. <laughs> nope. No. Mm. No. <laughs> Hmm. We. Oui. Oh, I guess I matched that one just pure chance. Oh, kitten. <laughs> no. Or for the blue dots up here. Yeah, got that. We. Oui. Oh, pink. I seen. I've seen that one. Nope. No. Oh, there it is. Yes. We. Oui. <laughs> oh. No. I know I've seen those. There they are. Okay. I told you I wasn't very good at these. <laughs> we. Oui. Let's see. Red dots. Red dots. No. No. Hmm. Oh, pink bunnies. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. We. Oui. Almost there. Hello, halfway now. Oh, kitten. No. No. Oh, there's the pears one. Yes. We. Oui. <laughs> and there's the kitten one. We. Oui. Okay, it's getting a little bit easier now. Hearts. There we go. We. Oui. Red polka dot. Red polka dot. We. Oui. Pink bunny. Pink bunny. We. Oui. Cheetah stripe. Er, cheetah spots. Er. No. Messed up that one. It's this one. Okay, we're almost there. We. Oui. And last but not least, actually, last one. Oui. My favorite would be the jack o' lantern underwear. Very good job. <laughs> All right. So usually when you click on the fireplace, you get um, Pinky's little story. <laughs> Her role in this area. So. Yep. Who are? We oui, Pinky. Will the future be like a movie with a happy ending? Will it be like a story that goes on and on? Will it be like a sailing ship with no captain? The future? Look at the lights of Paris. What about tonight? <laughs> Voila, c'est bonbon. <laughs> oh, that's just the panties again. <laughs> All right, so that was Poir's panties. Let's head back out to the rooftops. Make our next firewood delivery. Let's try this cinema. In 1899, Paris was home to all kinds of moving magic. It was possible at that time to peer at a zoetrope or panorama or motion picture and see something every bit as beautiful and fabulous as a genie that had just escaped mm. from a bottle. Pink A dropped a coin in the turnstile slot and entered the cinema Egypt. Pink A liked inventions in faraway places and she loved to imagine the future. The beam from the movie projector of Thomas Edison, an usher explained, is like a lighthouse showing the way to the future. 
Pinke followed the blazing beam of light to a seat in the front of the theater where she took in the last few minutes of a silent movie. In the orchestra pit, the piano player's gloved hands ran like white rabbits over the keyboard, and the music grew louder. Up on the screen, a radiant actress, almost as beautiful as Bonbon, swooned under the kisses of a handsome cowboy. <laughs> as the couple embraced, a small white heart appeared in the center of the screen and grew, grew, grew. Eventually, the entire screen was as blank as a freshly washed sheet Lucina had hung out to dry. The word fin appeared and floated in the middle of the white field, and the theater <laughs> lights came up. Pinkay dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief and blew her freckled nose like a little trumpet blast. Uh -huh. Then she slipped out of her seat and headed up and across the block to see her next customer. This is the Cairo Theater. <laughs> it's neat that um, almost all of these. <laughs> um, almost all of these seem to have a kind of uh, a cinema within the game element to them, and in the others, you could kind of watch these weird movies that were kind of a combination of um, public domain footage and cartoons and um, seems like in this one the cinema or no maybe if we look through these we'll see something yeah so we get the um, I think these are the zoetropes that they're talking about so we'll see what these look like an unexpected death <laughs> they have kind of a strange, eerie look to them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Here we are with the second. Let's see this. No witch. <laughs> this is neat, it's like a colorized um, film. Oh, that was just rather short. <laughs> okay, um, and finally the third one. Lunacy. Okay, well, that was quite a traffic jam. Um, look around the Cairo Theater some more. Oh yeah, there's the... The bunny. Oh. And tried the Sphinx. <laughs> Remembering better days before, before all of the 
Egyptian treasures were looted by the French, indeed. Hey, guys, it's just a disguise. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, um, looks like we've looked around the movie theater, so let's head back out to the rooftops here. And we did the bakery, that was where the philosophical breads were. We did the toy store, we did Poir Studio. So let's head back to the main street. To the left. <laughs> and we can now see the, um, the catacombs. Or Le Drinquet. Or the library from this. Or um, I think we already did the greenhouse, we checked that out. Uh, so yeah, let's go to the catacombs. A little spooky. <laughs> Do you think you guys can handle it? <laughs> doesn't look like a very reputable place, so let's listen to the story part. Story on! At the end of Rue de la Vie, where the street became very narrow and the light from the street lamps didn't quite reach, there was a small <laughs> set of stone stairs. Down these stairs was a small wooden door, and behind that door lay the catacombs. Hmm. Although they were home to some of Paris's longest residents, most people would not venture into the catacombs. But on some cold nights, accordion music traveled up through the street grate, so wistful and odd that Pinquet climbed down from her view of the stars and visited the lonely accordion player seated on his bony throne. <laughs> his stovepipe hat was ringed with artificial roses, and a pair of antlers jutted from it that cast crazy shadows around the cave. His belly was big and round with <laughs> snacks and sweets he snatched from kitchen pantries while delivering dreams to children around the city, and his clothing was covered with crumbs and grease. Near his feet was a sack stuffed with dreams, fibs, and fairy tales. Not much market for fairy tales in 1899, he explained to Pinquet. I think it's the new electric light bulb. <laughs> it's chased all the fairy tales back into dark corners. But tonight's a big night for dreams, good and bad, he explained, pulling an eclair from his pocket and setting it on the arm of his chair. So I can't stay down here gabbing. <laughs> but I will tell you a little secret. I've seen some of tonight's dreams. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. At this, he rubbed his hands together. And the future should be interesting. Interesting. And I hope filled with good things to eat. <laughs> of course. He stuffed the eclair into his mouth and vanished up through a street grate to begin delivering that evening's dreams, leaving behind a single soiled petal from a paper rose. All right, so this is an interesting character. He lives in the catacombs. <laughs> I'm dead. Me too. Me three. Ooh. <laughs> Ghost steals your eclair. At the end of your road. At the dark of your day, your bones all go their separate ways. Go ya old in a bed, go ya young in a blaze. Your bones all go their separate ways. Busy little bugs make dust of your guts, which ain't much more than a bag of smoke. Guts gone quicker than a paycheck at poker, faster than the friend of a friend gone broke. 
they never could stand you or your clothes they'll blow as far as any wind blows your bones are contrary scraping together waiting and waiting to be rid of each other from stem to stern and they're gonna rattle and roll down different ways and various holes at the end of your road at the dark of your days your bones all go this separate <laughs> ways goodbye bones <laughs> so we got a very morbid song about skeletons and catagombs and etc. from this fellow. See us in his bag. Ooh. Grandma, Paris is so beautiful it seems like a dream. I was born in Paris long ago. A time before popsicles and paperbacks. A time before you had dipped your one tiny toe in the ocean, squirming with starfish and sea anemones. <laughs> so that's the dreams in the bag. Dreams of the forthcoming century. Does something special happen if you click on his hat? Oh no, he just does the song again. At the end of I'm not, not interested. <laughs> it was a nice song, but a little bit bleak. Alright, so... Let's head back. Hmm, part two next. Let's check out Le Drinke, even though it's probably not an appropriate place for this little girl to be. <laughs> On December 31st of each year, Le Drinke was the busiest shop on Red Nose Street. <laughs> Through the window, Pinkay watched the owner, Edgar, stand behind the counter polishing the shiny green glass bottles. Pinkay knocked on the frosted window and waved at Edgar. As she entered the shop, Edgar pulled the glass he kept for Pinkay from behind the counter and filled it with Le Drinquet, Paris's most popular fizzy lemonade. Oh, okay, so it's non-alcoholic. Pinkay <laughs> pulled her glass up Hopefully. to her nose and watched with one eye closed as bubbles drifted slowly up the side like mermaids lazing to the surface of a lake. The cat, Alphonse, swished huh? his tail from side to side in time with ticking from the grandfather clock on the wall. It's eight o'clock, Pinkay, Edgar said. In just a few hours, the future will be here. That's exciting. Glass shoe. Hello. Have I told you about the <laughs> night they invented the drink, eh? Oh, no. A certain Monsieur Fizet fell asleep in the lemon grove, forgetting to cork twelve bottles of lemonade. It was a warm August night, and as he slept, twelve silver stars crept down the cool stairs of moonlight. They each wanted to try a little sip from those irresistibly shiny green bottle. And comes up. Soon, all twelve stars had each fallen into a bottle. <laughs> Dawn's light found Monsieur Fizet corking up the bottle to be sent to Paris, where they were purchased by American expatriate Jacques Black and consumed from the dainty shoe of dancer Teresa Ladrinque. <laughs> Sacre bleu! The darling dancer exclaimed, So many bubble! This drink is filled with stars! The fizzy beverage has ever been honored 
with the mademoiselle's last name, Le Drinquet, and its colorful label illustrate the night of its discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon cigars. The wax museum of Madame Tutos. Visit if you dare. La baguette. This industry will never last. <laughs> Moving pictures. <laughs> Squirrel from Luxembourg Garden paints winning portrait at the Académie Française. Gotta fire our quirks at the bad guys. Oh no! Ah. Uh. Man, that's pretty brutal. My score 2. Their score 32. <laughs> Is this even feasible? Okay, let's move this guy. Ah. Ah. Why am I dying so much? Well, it wasn't quite as bad that time, but... It's a little too tough for me, I guess. I'm a beverage weenie. There's the light. We gotta get, click on the cat. <laughs> the Nine Lives of Alphonse. Let's see. This will be entertaining. Opera singer. <laughs> Princess. Mad scientist. <laughs> Happy boy. <laughs> country cat. <laughs> Just hanging out in the country. Aww. Orphan. <laughs> cat burger. <laughs> Number eight. Guess he's on his eighth life now. What will nine be? Who knows? That's the future. That's kind of the the theme overall. <laughs> no one can know for sure what the future holds. future be like? Pioche will grow from trees. Little girls will sprout wings <laughs> and fly above your rooftops. The Seine River will flow with the drink A. Eh? Things like that. Oh, Edgar. That's silly. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we saw what everybody had to say at Le Drink A. Eh? I guess we can head down to the library. A small wood furnace stood in a corner of the library. 
Pinkay fed it with scraps of old newspapers. There goes yesterday, she shouted as she pushed another sheet of yellowed paper in and clapped the iron door closed after it. Hundreds of books were stacked everywhere in the library. They lay on windowsills and in wicker baskets. Some were stuffed in stacks, others spilled from shelves. They spiraled up the stairs into the domed ceiling and out of sight. Benjamin, the librarian, shuffled a stack of papers on his desk. His pen scratched against the notebook pages like a chicken in the yard. He was writing a book entitled 20th Century Dreams. In the 20th century, Benjamin explained, aeroplanes will scoop up snow from mountaintops and drop it over cities simmering with the heat of summer. In the future, we will stroll along the rings of Saturn on a Saturday night. Pink A sat for a while in the corner near the stove, counting her kindling sticks and tending her tinderbox. As she worked, she imagined what the 20th century would be like, letting Benjamin's words drift in her mind like snow falling over Paris in July. Mm. <laughs> so here we have Benjamin writing down his 20th century dreams. Has a nice snowman on his desk. <gasps> I recklessly melted him, but thank goodness he has ice breath. <gasps> this is quite strange. <laughs> Tattoos, of, tattoos South of South Sea Excuse Sailors me? by Eugene Swampsmore. <laughs> the South Seas are a group of seas which are located to the far to the south of the library where you are reading this book. A lot of sailors sail through there, and a lot of them get tattoos. <laughs> I became curious as to why and traveled there myself to investigate. This book is the result. I should mention that when I presented this report to the Academy of Tattooology, <laughs> of which I was then a well-respected member, they laughed me out the door. Granted, the book is a bit choppy, a bit rough and tumble, but then so are the South Seas. I remain confident in making the assertion <clears throat> that this is a valuable <laughs> work of tattoo scholarship. Eugene Schwab's more Bamboo Island, 1899. Alright, so <laughs> poor Eugene, but we'll see if this is a true work of value in tattoo scholarship now. As you can see, even the Spoo Boo, Bon Bon's grandmother, <laughs> appears in a tropical apparel on the arm of a sailor from France. Ugh. <laughs> Spelling errors are <laughs> all too common. Why? Don't, Don't ask. ask. <laughs> Moom. <laughs> Merg skip squared. No fair. How? Ugh, an interesting question. How did that ship get in the bottle? <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Here's a picture of me. I'm the guy who's wearing the spectacles. Oh my These god. These other guys are my research assistants. <laughs> Don't miss my next book. <laughs> One from the hut. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well... I may have to agree a little bit with the assertion that this is not a very solid academic work, but <laughs> it was a labor of love, I could tell. Poems of Smoke by Lodi Bear. Lodi Bear. All right, let's see. <laughs> oh. Looking very intimidating. Hmm. 
the smoke of Paris, glittering city, city full of dreams. <laughs> Where smoke at night drifts by the passerby. Wow. What do this white plume hide? I don't know, man. A coal glitters like a jewel held in the clammy paw of a six-year-old. <laughs> well, that's a bit bleak. What strange light will be cast upon the future of France? Hmm. Throughout this century, there will be beret, a baguette, snooty waiters, and accordion music. Ooh, la la. <laughs> that one was pretty intense. All right, let's see. We have milk art. True story by R. Johans Klein. <laughs> I can't believe I said that out loud before I realized. Okay, next page. Meet Unga. Unga is a milkmaid who lives in the Alps. Every year during the cold alpine winter, all of the milk that Unga has gathered freezes. She and her faithful friend Fritz the Goat make sculptures from the milky ice. Some of the sculptures are realistic. Some are abstract. <laughs> Unga's relatives are very- Not nothing! Oh. Nathan, wait! <laughs> Very opinionated, each member of her family has a different favorite sculpture. That doesn't bother Unga. Opinions vary, that's what she'll say if you ask. Pop Pop Grunlund likes the abstract sculptures. Auntie Wolfkin prefers the realistic works. <laughs> Don't believe milk Unga thinks that all art made from milk is fantastic and wondrous. Fritz agrees. Long live milk art, they shout. The end. So those are the books that he's consulting on this auspicious evening. <laughs> Alright, shall- oop, sit on the ladder. More aliens. <laughs> See what his 20th century dreams are. By, <laughs> by Benjamin Walter. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Got some aliens and fire and space bears. Exhibit A France on the moon. Exhibit B Fire Jetpack Man. <laughs> they drink A becomes a very faddish sort of UFO shaped building. Space cars and fashionable alien ladies. Astronaut fashion shows and astronaut dogs. <laughs> Making little French. I don't know what that even is, like a little cart or something to go on the moon. 
Pegget and Soda Robot. And they're friends with children even, giving them flowers. So it's all good. Well, that's pretty intense, but... Let's see. <laughs> You're writing a book about the 20th century? Ooh, what will happen then? Uh, we'll be able to stroll the rings of Saturn on Saturday nights. Aeroplane will scoop up snow from the mountain tops and drop it over cities, simmering with the heat of summer. Oh, Walter, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, Walter, I don't think so. <laughs> The aliens have left to monitor other places in France. Alright, now we're gonna go to the left. See what we can see on this street. We got the cheese shop, the wax museum, the sign maker, and the follies. Um I think I'm gonna start with the follies. Let's start there. Let me just dive right down the chimney. <laughs> Paris had folded up the day like one of Poir's cloth coats and pulled on the sparkly razzle dazzle dress of evening. Darkness moved across the rooftops like a black cat stretching his forepaws, and the city lights shone like feline eyes aglow. Gentlemen and ladies stepped out of coaches and cabs and into nightclubs. Each of these night spots was a separate universe. There was the Colonial Club, where monkeys swung from real banana trees. The Bull Club, where everyone could dine discreetly in their own igloo. And the Saturn Room, where patrons knew exactly what it was like to swing on a star. Of these attractions, Pinquet was fondest of the folie, where the girls stuffed Pinquet with sweets and the dressing room swirled with the smell of face powder and other heavenly scents. But best of all, the folie had Bonbon, Pinquet's bon bon. best friend, who sang and danced in the footlights of the little stage nightly. Yeah, we've heard a bit about Bonbon, bon, so now we get to see her, or at least her place of business. Oh, tonight we have small child and horse, or that looks, that's probably Bonbon bon there. Should we ask? Mm, this guy doesn't want to talk to me. He's too busy being existential. Your petty mouth, your petty bush, <laughs> your little kiss. Je t'aime you, la vie is pink when I'm with you. But when you're gone, la life is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
shoes is pink. My chambre too. If it's a do, they'll all seem blue. A cow's not pink, nor little mice, but make me lonely, and that's not nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> oh, now I can talk to him. Hmm. <laughs> Ennui manicure. <sighs> Sorry, all gone. It's not a very good bar. See what the other share they have is the one with the horse. It's a small child and horse. Attention, tout le monde, mes amis, put your eyes to the stage. We have something tremendous to see. Wow. Counting us, mon Dieu, can you believe? And this miniature master, Scratch a Blue. Hello, my name is Scratch. Here's my horse, he'll count for you. Wow. The horse of numbers, great and small. Watch us now, he'll count them all. Seventeen plus thirty-two. Forty-nine! That's right, it's true. Fourteen thousand times twenty-three. Three hundred and twenty-two thousand! He's smart, you see? <laughs> No counting aids does he use No abacus and no slide rule Now you see now that he can do Hooray for the horse a scratchable I don't know, that horse may be smart but he didn't really look that healthy Alright, what are you doing up to? What a nice trick. <sighs> but this is the Ennui pub, so can't be too excited about it. Ah, Bonbon, pride of the folie. Her dancing was like a puppet being controlled on the left side by one puppeteer and on the right by another. Her blonde hair stood straight up from her head and waved like seaweed under the stage lights. And her high tones were likened in newspaper reviews to the sound of someone stepping on a uh -huh. kitten. But her charms bewitched all who saw her nonetheless. Pink A liked to sit in the backstage dressing room and watch Bonbon rouge her lips and powder her neat little nose. A famous poet had written a poem about the little chanteuse in the paper that week, and Pink A unfolded the paper and showed it to her. Your eyes glow, glow like, like shop, shop windows, windows, it began. Bonbon yawned, clipped it out <laughs> with her nail scissors and tacked it up with a dozen other poems above her dressing table. Nice. You know so much about poetry, Bonbon. You're sure to know about tomorrow. The future belongs to Pinke, but tonight is for Bonbon.
it looks like Bonbon is possibly from Scotland. Got the. Or perhaps she just travels a lot. <laughs> Riding a camel. Oh, and there's her stage dress. Nice. I would wear that. Voila! Spring is here. <laughs> Whoa, that's a little wild. Nice. Why moi? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Art review. Who shall save France from her artists? <laughs> An outrage. <laughs> My six year old could have done them. Could we? But is it art? No. Cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that this elderly poet is the one who has been slipping anonymous love poems under the door of Bon Bon's dressing room? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Ooh, we have a fashion magazine as well. <laughs> Wrapped in Venus de Milo's arms. <laughs> Personal sailboat. <laughs> this is all very trendy. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Stop it, you beast! <laughs> <laughs> ah, shut up, dog. <laughs> Bon bon, I dream of you, even as the bull charges. <laughs> Lovely bon bon, I'm sorry I was startled when I found your dog Otto had made off with my rugby gear. <laughs> so these are all from her admirers. Ooh. Stanford. Bit of an older gentleman there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I already saw that one. Dog interlude there. <laughs> Signing autographs. Aaron, I think we already saw that one. And in New York. New York City welcomes Bumble.
Ooh, let's see what's in the drawer. Infinity perfume. Oh. <laughs> To the bar, I guess. Paris had folded up the day like one of Poire's cloth coats and pulled on the sparkly razzle dazzle dress of evening. Darkness moved across yes. the rooftops like a black cat stretched. Story off. All right, so let's head back to the rooftops. Oh, we already did the greenhouse. We got the sign maker, the wax museum, and quill fromage. I want to go to the cheese shop. Oh my. This is strange. Looks like we got the cheese revolution. I guess they do call it a cheese block. <laughs> Goodness. Liberty began. Fromage day. Oh, that was certainly a cheese shop. It's rather bizarre. <laughs> um, let's get to the sign maker then. Oh, he has a little pigeon. Let's hear his story first. At that time, Paris was populated by a profusion of signs. Jaco, the sign maker, was busy making signs for the bakery, the toy shop, the wax museum, and of course even Bonbon had her own sign. An orangeade bottle decorated the top of the Eiffel Tower, and an advertisement featuring a pair of Monsieur Vuvu's silver shoes skipped along the Seine. Poor Jaco's eyesight was not what it used to be. Hmm. When Pinquet came by each evening to deliver a bundle of kindling, she often had to help Jaco match the right word with the right picture on his signs. That night, Jaco slept before his easel, dreaming of the new year. The lenses of his glasses enlarged his eyes enormously, like a detective examining evidence through a magnifying glass. His palette was balanced on his lap, and his smock was colored here and there with splashes of paint. His snores resounded through the studio, and his paintbrush was still in his hand. Pink A saw that he had painted the word bakery over a picture of a fat pink pig holding uh -huh. a fork and knife. Next to that, the words butcher shop were neatly printed beneath a croissant Philippe had designed to resemble the man in the moon. Ooh la la, he's got it all topsy-turvy, said Pinquet, and rushed over to fix Jaco's signs as he slept. Oh, You got some lay mineral spirits. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Go on, ask me anything. Mm. Type your question. He's been deaf for many a year. Just a moment. 
He is thinking about your question. Please, be patient. <laughs> After all, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> I tried to get on his level, but he says he's not sure why one would even ask a bird that sort of question. I, I suppose that's fair. I was condescending to him. Alright, let's see what else is here. We got some nice paintings. Ah, oh, we have to help him finish the signs. Match the words with the pictures. Click and drag. Well, this one is... Beret. This one is... Le Beret. La Pomme. Alright. La Pomme. Try again. We got le vin down here. Le vin. And le chat up here. Le chat. Alright. Um, one more time. Let's see. <laughs> Ooh. L'enfant. My terrible French pronunciation. L'enfant. La fille. La fille. All right. Head back. Ooh. Oh, I just did that. Ooh. You dead child. <laughs> you are too. I'm glad I clicked on this again because this is pretty funny. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> we gotta do it again. Help this guy out. La pomme. Le beret. Okay, let's head back. We did one more, one extra. You really gotta get a handle on doing this yourself, dude. <laughs> Some lovely satyrs. The fairies in the willow trees are magic. This is quite psychedelic. But is it art? I think it's beautiful. Alright buddy, well, hope you wake up for the new year, for the whole century turning over. Where else do we have to go? I think just the wax museum now. So let's hop in there. The wax museum of Madame Tuto's lay on the far <laughs> side of the Seine River, down a crooked little street. The roof of the museum was black and pointed like a witch's hat. And from its peak that night, Pinquet could see people unloading the fireworks for the New Year's display. Pinquet stopped to watch them for a moment before climbing down the sooty chimney to start the fire for Madame Tutos. You're late, said Madame mm. Tutos as Pinky exited the hearth. But do come in. Build the fire up nice and high, ma chérie. I wanted to blaze until midnight, but take care not to melt <laughs> my dear friends, my waxy treasures. 
my dear friends, my waxy treasures. Let's take a look around. Ooh, cigar. Cigar gingerbread man. <laughs> What's happening here? Mesdames et messieurs, allez par ici pour entrer au musée de wax. Je vous présente votre guide dans la musée, Madame Tuto. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Je m'appelle Madame Tutos. <laughs> I'm so happy to guide you on a tour of my waxy treasures. In our rooms, you will see some of the greatest figures of French history, captured in wax and frozen for all time. <laughs> Look here, Louis XIV, the glorious Sun King, and the grand architect of Versailles, the palace of many pleasures. <laughs> and for those of you with a taste for the literary, Witness the genius Victor Hugo poised over one of his many masterworks. Pen in hand, candle burning, perhaps he is creating his hunchback of Notre Dame, the agile but hideous bell ringer. And here, down this passageway, all oh, hide the eyes of the infant and the faint of heart. It is in this room that every hour, only hour, the guillotine folds anew on the dainty head of Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Careful now, here the flames soar to consume the virginal body of the maid of Orléans, put to death by the cruel <laughs> roast beef. Shed a tear for France's greatest heroine, Joan of Arc. As marshmallow. May she burn forever, but never melt. Ah, a poignant conclusion to a tour of our waxy catacombs. Do not miss our gift shop on your way out. <laughs> that was nice. Here we have Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Hanging out with Wolf Grandma. <laughs> and the... The Cinderella of the future. Turn on the radio. See if I can get a song. See if we can start up again. Very relaxing. <laughs> so that's the Cinderella of the future.
Alright, so I think we've seen the three main things in the wax museum, um, and I think that means we've visited all the locales here. We have the wax museum, sign maker, greenhouse, which we did, cheese shop, the follies, uh, and just go back to the main street, check out what's there. I saw the toy store, and then they drink K catacombs. So yeah, this was really interesting. It's a totally different art style, and I think um, definitely a lot more sophisticated with the um, the animations and stuff. Uh, shh, dog. Um, again, I would just suggest if you want to see more of this. Um, her uh, film work, which went to the Venice Biennale, um, is also on YouTube. It's called The History of Glamour, so I would check that out if you want kind of similar um, sound design and animation and themes. But yeah, so now I've covered um, all three of the games that were conserved by Rhizome, and I think it was a really great time. I'd have to say my favorite was probably Smarty, the second one. So that's the one that I'd most recommend, but all three of them were pretty interesting. So yeah, let's see what happens when we say au revoir. Au revoir. Pink A had finished her nightly rounds, and the dark sky in her little corner of Paris was filled with weaving smoke from chimneys. Golden light reflected onto the faces and hands of those who warmed themselves by the dozen or so fires she had lain. All the snow clouds had blown away over France, and the night was now still and clear. She stopped before returning home to admire the dazzling winter dots of Orion overhead. A shooting star streaked across Orion's belt, followed by another and another. Bursts sounded from the banks of the sand. They weren't shooting stars at all, Pinke realized, but the uh -huh. New Year's fireworks flaring up into the sky. Zap! Zip! Whee! Sparks spiraled up into the night, where they joined their cousins, the stars. Pinke watched as silvery sparks burst into fireworks. They formed the number one, followed by the number nine. Next, there came a glittering gold zero. And next to that, another sparkling zero. The one and nine began to fade, but the zero zero lingered over Paris. Two zeros like the portholes of a ship, sailing from the 19th century to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Two zeros like the bowls of an hourglass, dropping tiny grains of sand into infinity. Pinke slung her empty kindling sack over her shoulder, and after casting a last look at yesterday, she walked over the rooftops toward home. Pinke put on her rabbit pajamas and stood in front of the round window in the room she shared with her sisters. The seven sisters had awakened from their sleep and joined Pinke at the window, where the last fireworks reflected pink and green on their sleepy faces. What time is it, they asked, as the <laughs> last of the fireworks faded. Six, seven, it's the future, said Pinke. We're there. <laughs>
Alright, well that was <laughs> that was really nice. Um and it was kind of this uh I guess abstract, not quite in order, kind of non nonlinear take on a children's book because I don't know, whatever order you still deliver the kindling to old people, you still kind of get the same conclusion when she's walking back at midnight. Um but still it kind of allows for I guess your own interpretation and um take on events. So yeah, that was that was really great. That was um really cool and I think it was a good way to wrap up the um this trilogy of games. So yeah, if you enjoyed it you can check out um the games themselves and play them on the Rhizome website. Um and I guess thanks for watching each of these little let's plays I did for them.